theme of all of the, the songs and the great reminder uh, that they are to us. Hey, real quick question. John, are you leaving this week? Are you going back? Today. You leave today. Okay, great. You know, I, for the last two, three weeks, I need to talk to you, and I need to talk to Chris Perkins, too. So I keep forgetting after the service. So if you guys can come and talk to me, they're all good, okay? If you could see the panic-stricken look on his face right now, <laughs> you know what that means. Such power I have <laughs> to strike fear into them. No, it's, it's all good, but I just have uh, uh, I've been forgetting after the service. I've got so many things going on. Um, I want to begin this morning by reading our scripture. We're going back to the book of James. And so if you haven't turned there already, you want to go to James chapter 3. Uh, we're going to take the end of the chapter, verses 13 uh, through 18. And um, we're going to do something a little bit different. And, and actually, I want to do this for, for all of the services. Um, it's really been you know, impressed upon me over this last month that we are so saturated with the Word of God that... You know, we have radio, Christian radio, and we have speakers, and we have messages, and you know, we have books, and, and we get so much uh, availability of the Word of God that sometimes we lose the understanding that this is God's Word, that this is God speaking. And, you know, familiarity, you know, breeds contempt or, or just apathy sometimes. And we forget that, that not only is this the Word of God, but the Word became Flesh. I mean, so much is, is this tied to God and who He is. That Word literally became flesh. And so what I want to do, and I know other churches have done this, um, in reference to the Word of God, I, I'm going to try, and you guys need to help to remind me, but when we read the main portion of Scripture that we're going to be dealing with that morning, I'm going to ask you to stand as I read. I know just, you know, you say, well, I can be reverent sitting, and, and that's true, but sometimes it's just change of posture to say, that God, we know that this is special, that this is different. Um, it will just help us to connect a little more. So I'm going to ask you to stand together and then remain standing for prayer as I read our, our verses for us today. Verse 13 says, Who among you is wise and understanding? Let him show by his good behavior his deeds and gentleness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. This wisdom is not that which comes down from above, but is earthly, natural, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exists, there is disorder and every evil thing. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering, without hypocrisy, and the seed whose fruit is righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. So Father, I'm asking you now to just take your word and just penetrate our hearts with it, Father. I ask you to speak to us today. We need to hear from you, not from a man, not from any man. We need to hear the word of God. So I ask you to work through me as your instrument, Lord. But Father, I, I ask you to allow us to, those who know you, that have your Holy Spirit living within us, Father, for us to release that, to, to take your word and to, to connect it to our life as only you can, Father. I thank you in my son's name. scripture today is going to compare wisdom, which is from above, wisdom which is from God, with wisdom that is from the world, wisdom that is just natural, but ultimately leads to evil. So literally we could say we've got the wisdom of man versus the wisdom of God. Now I do want to make one clarification here before I start out. This is not a comparison between Christians and those who aren't Christians. To say Christians are smarter than those who aren't Christians because that's not necessarily true. There are principles of godly wisdom that are being used throughout our society by the saved and by unsaved alike. Things like integrity and honesty and compassion, work ethic, so many of the things that the scripture talks 
about. And this wisdom is from God. And it's universal in its application. When a non-Christian applies God's wisdom in their life, their life is better. They're still eternally lost. It doesn't make them saved. But their life is better when they use the wisdom of God. And by the same token, just because we are Christians doesn't mean that we're following God's wisdom. We may know God's wisdom, but certainly as a Christian, there are many Christians that make unwise decisions, even though we know wisdom. As a matter of fact, if you think of a great biblical example of Solomon, you know, given wisdom by God, but the choices he made, you know, led to, to disaster in his life and ultimately, you know, the split of the kingdom of Israel. The concern uh, that we have here is that there is a demonic wisdom that is permeating the world and it appeals to our fleshly nature. And you say, well, why is this being written here? Why is this being written to Christians? Because the same sort of wisdom appeals to us. It resonates with our flesh, with our old natures. It's intoxicating. And it also runs in contrast to God's wisdom. So the question that is going to be before us this morning is whose wisdom are you following today? Whose wisdom are you pursuing? Now, most everyone here would say that they have wisdom, you know. But the question is, whose wisdom? I would agree, we all have wisdom. But whose wisdom? I mean, we live in a society that, you know, wisdom, understanding, truth, it's being determined by polling. Wisdom and the way things should be and morality, all these things are determined by the majority rules. And then with things like our, our social media, Twitter, YouTube, Facebook, everyone can openly expound their opinion on a whole plethora of subjects. And it's so empowering. You know, I am so wise that I write these things and it goes out there and, and everybody reads my opinions to think that people are listening to you, that people are interested in your thoughts. And we live today in a sea of opinions. Now, years ago, um, I used to be on Facebook. I've been on it for a couple years now. And, and Facebook, it's not all bad. But I got to tell you, I got off it because I found myself, when I was on Facebook and I was reading everything people was writing, I literally could feel my brain cells dying. I mean, <clears throat> folks, the opinions that are out there, and everybody has something to say about everybody, even if they're not directly involved in it. And for a Christian, for you today, for you, we are, we are bombarded hourly by worldly wisdom. Everywhere we go is worldly wisdom. And yet many seek spiritual refreshment only on Sunday morning. This is what we're up against. An avalanche of worldly wisdom, and sometimes we give just very little to the ability of putting God's wisdom into our life. Well, true to James, his no-nonsense approach to the truth, and as we've been, you know, kind of, you know, a little more than halfway through the book, um, James, he just comes right to the point, and, and I love this about James. He says in verse 13, Who among you is wise and understanding? Let him show by his good behavior his deeds and the gentleness of wisdom. Now if you remember where we are in the book of James and, and everything that we've covered thus far, James has been giving us a series of tests to put our lives to so that we can know whether we have a genuine Christian life. Some to know that they are genuinely Christians, but if we are Christians, are we really following after Christ? And he's talked to us about many things that help reveal this to our life. Uh, a real challenge he has given us to see how serious we are about following Christ, or is it just words that we're giving? Remember in chapter 1, he talked about saving faith is going to be seen in how you respond to trials. When 
negative things come into your life, bad things come into your life, sickness, losses of jobs, heartaches, all those sorts of things. Who do you turn to? Who is your hope in them? All these songs that we just sang here about running to Christ and finding a shelter in Him. Where are you going? And that's going to reveal how we handle trials. Or do we become bitter, angry, disillusioned? Do we, do we question God? The second part of the chapter, chapter 1, he said genuine faith is seeing how a person responds to God's word. When you read it, do you, do you read it and you say, oh, that's true, oh, yeah, I need to do that, yep, 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 and just put it on a walkway and I don't do anything? You know, like looking in the mirror and seeing what's wrong, but, you know, not, not combing my hair, straightening my tie, doing what the mirror reveals? As a genuine Christians, we read God's word as God is speaking to us. If I'm truly following after him, if I'm doing my faith, I, I approach God's word differently, especially in the world that constantly will quote it or portions of it or suddenly Christmas and Easter come around and, you know, and, and, and suddenly they'll turn to God and they'll show up at church and those sorts of things. Well, that, that's, a true believer has that hunger to have God speak to him, speak to her, to, to change, to be like Christ. Then he came to chapter 2 and he saw that genuine faith will be revealed in a person and how they respond to needy people. In other words, as you go through life, you see someone who is poor, someone who is destitute, and you have the means to help them. But you just say, go thou be filled. It's revealing. Because if you're truly a believer, if you are truly following Christ, you have the eyes of Christ. You respond to people like Christ responded to them. I mean, the only thing I could do is reach out. The only thing, if I have the means to help, is to help and do what is necessary. The end of chapter 2. He said, saving faith is seen in a person's righteous works. Remember we talked about faith without works is dead. You, know, you, can, you can say you have faith all you want, but if it's not followed by actions, if it's not coming out, losing out of you, and what you do, what use is it? It's literally dead. And then the last time we were in James in chapter 3, we saw saving faith can be seen in how we use one's tongue. Remember it said our tongue is like a rudder of a ship. It's like the bit in the horse's mouth. And it points us to, to where we want to go. And your tongue and how we use our tongue, how I use my tongue is very revealing of what I'm really pursuing, what direction I really want to go. And now James comes to the end of chapter 3. And he says that a true believer shows the wisdom of God in his actions, in the choices that we make in our Verse 13 again says, Who among you is wise and understanding? Let him show by his good behavior, his deeds and the gentleness of wisdom. So in truth, again, we would all probably say we have wisdom. I'd be surprised if I asked that question, if I said who's wiser and who's a fool. I'd be surprised if people were saying, no, I'm a fool. Raise your hand, you probably would be. <laughs> to which God would say, Well, your actions reveal whose wisdom you're really following. If you're wise or you're a fool, your actions are going to determine that, not just you know where you would classify yourself. But here's the dilemma that we have in Christianity, and that we have in living in the, the, the culture and the society that we live in today. You see, we often don't see this need of our life to have God's wisdom and to apply God's wisdom because we have something else. Many people call it, we have, we have street smarts. And, and a lot of times, you know, even you know, people who claim Christ, they, they will wear this as a badge of honor. I, I have street smarts. You know, you might have book learning, book smarts. But I've got street smarts. And, you know, when we're saying that, it means, you know, that this type of smarts helps us navigate the world. It helps us compete. It helps us survive, even get ahead in this sin-fallen environment. But the problem that, that James is revealing here is street smarts doesn't do the will of God. Its focus isn't eternal. It's not thinking about the afterlife. It's thinking about the here and now. It's thinking about what's best for, for the immediate. It's about competing. It's about winning. Street smarts focuses on me and helping me and helping me get ahead. 
and, and, and me get through this life. But God's wisdom is so different. It is eternally focused. A lot of times when I'm living God's wisdom, I'm called to put other people first. Sometimes God's wisdom calls me to allow myself to be wronged. God's wisdom tells us to, to turn the other cheek. And the, and the problem we have here in Christianity and our culture is, as a Christian, I don't often see my lack or my need in this area of wisdom. Because by the world standard, because I've got street smarts, I'm succeeding. I'm winning. You know, I've got a good job. I've got possessions. I have that, that, that position. And no matter how bad or guilty I might feel when I pick God's word up or when I go to church and I hear things and oh I feel bad I'm not doing it all and, and you know we lay this guilt upon us no matter how bad I feel I'm not I walk out into the world where I probably spend you know 95% of my time and I'm a success you know I, I may not have a testimony in Christ but when I go to work I'm a success and sometimes worldly wisdom that street smarts is kind of like a placebo that gives us this false security that, that things are okay in our life. So we have a contrast here between man's wisdom, which is described in verse 15. This is man's wisdom. This wisdom is not from above, which comes down from above. Uh, this wisdom is not that which comes down from above, but it is earthly. It is natural. It's the most natural thing for us to do. But he has that word, it's demonic. So you have a contrast between that wisdom and God's wisdom. And these are determined, he says, by our actions, are the results of what's going on in our life. Man's wisdom is described in verse 14 and verse 16. God's wisdom is described in verse 17 and 18. And we're going to take a look at those in, in just a second here. But for a moment, I want to focus on the second part of verse 13 there. It says, who among you is wise and understanding? This is the part I want to focus on. Let him show by his good deep behavior, his deeds and the gentleness of wisdom. Okay, you say you're wise. Let's put it to the test. Let's look at your deeds. Let's look at your, your actions. And you see, this is one of the things that is being lost in Christianity today. You know, the truth that genuine Christianity when I am truly a Christian, it is going to flow out of my life. It flows out of my heart. But it's going to be lived out there. It is going to be able to be seen in our life. How can, when a person gets saved, one of the things that happens in our life is we receive the Holy Spirit. Part of the, the Trinity, the Godhead, takes residency in my life. God is living within me. How in the world can that not be seen? In my hands, in my feet, in my mouth, in my tongue, in my actions, in, in the decisions that I make. And we're losing that in Christianity. And so much, it's, you know, it's not so much by my actions of what I do, but what I believe and, and what I say. So we go to work. And at work, we should be living a, a different type of a wisdom than others are living at work. Our life skills as a Christian should be different than those who have the natural life skills in this world. But so often, they're not any different when we're at work. We compromise our faith just so we can get ahead or keep up. We listen to crass jokes, laugh at them, maybe we even participate and move them along. Sometimes the only real evidence of our faith at work is that we have this religious calendar that, that hangs up in our cubicle. And then for, for, for you teens down here at school, you know, we, we can converse on all the latest gossip. I can tell you what's going on in Madonna's life, the Kardashians, Miley Cyrus. We know all of the latest terms that are out there. We can name all the secular rap artists. Matter of fact, I can even sing along with their songs. You know, we can play those violent video games. 
we can watch lewd movies. You know, we know everything that's going on on YouTube. But hey, my testimony to the world is that I go to youth group. You know, the opposite of wise is a fool. And the Hebrew definition of a fool, I've shared this before, it's very pictorial. It envisions a door on a person's mind. And it says a fool's door is always open. They don't know when to close it to keep the wrong things out. And they don't know when to keep it open to, to allow the right things in. And we really do find ourselves, so many who claim Christ, we are playing the fool before the world. Because we are letting everything in. The world, culture, philosophy, entertainment. Oh, we let church in too. You know, we 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 you know we you know we love God. We let church in too. And it's so easy to roll your eyes at this because you're successful in the world, or you're cool at school. And hey, what's that old preacher know? You know, he might have Bible smarts, but I have street smarts. And and. I know what it's like to, to, to function in this world and to get out there and, and to succeed. And shame on us for trampling the name of Jesus Christ. You see, it's not about us living perfect lives. It's not about us not struggling with being drawn to the allure of the world because it is intoxicating. The natural wisdom the problem is, for many, we don't even want to have verse 17. You know, we don't even want to have what it says there. It says, but the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, and gentle, and reasonable, and full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering, without hypocrisy. Or we say, well, we want them, but we also want the world, jealousy, and that selfish ambition because we want the world's approval. We want the world's success because it's so alluring. You know, we've said before that, you know, Missouri claims to be the show-me state. But Christianity is the show-me faith. Show me God. Show me that your faith makes a difference in your life when trials come. That you're not tossed to and fro like everybody else in the world. Show me that you have that anchor, that rock on Jesus Christ to carry you through those times. Show me that when you read the word of God, that it resonates with your heart. And you have a passion and a desire to be obedient and to change. Show me that when you see a needy person and, and you can do something about it, show me to put hands and feet to your Christianity. To reach out, to give up your time, to give up your resources, whatever it might be. To give up your comfort. Give up your comforts. To reach out to somebody else. Show me your righteous faith by your righteous works. Show me by how you use your tongue and where it directs you. And show me that all of this teaching that we do, all of this studying of my word, Learning all of this truth. Show me that it matters anything to your practical life. Show me that it matters when you go to work. Show me that it matters when you go to school or in your neighborhood or in your family. Show me. We have to show you that that's what he wants us to do. It is going to come on the outside of our life. So a fair question for us is verse 17. You know, it says, what does, what does it mean when it's talking about this type of wisdom? It says that the wisdom from above is first pure. What, what is pure wisdom? And peaceable and gentle and reasonable and full of mercy and, and good fruits, unwavering, without hypocrisy. Well, what's that talking about there? Well, the, these are, are not, you know, when you say the definition of what wisdom is, but actually they're the result of the wisdom that you're following. These are the results, purity. These are the results, you know, not living a hypocritical life. The result of following God's wisdom is, is, is good fruits. It reveals whether or not you're, you're truly pursuing after God. 
Your wisdom, my wisdom is shown in the hundreds of decisions that I make in a day, that you make in a day. Whose wisdom are you following? That will be shown by the results of those decisions. It will be seen in your life. God's wisdom leads to purity. Man's wisdom leads to evil things. And I was thinking in the past couple of weeks, I was thinking about some examples of this. Man's wisdom, God's wisdom, particularly the area of that purity and, and the area of, of evil, the opposite. And there, there are a lot of good examples out there. Let me give you a couple of them. The world's wisdom in movies, and I know you guys all know this, we have, we have ratings of our movies, and we have an R-rated movie, and the definition of an R-rated movie, I looked this up, it's, it, it has adult-type themes not appropriate for children. So, follow the wisdom there. By the world's wisdom, as we get older, it's okay to listen to the vulgar language. When I'm older, it's okay to listen, look at those sexually explicit scenes. When I'm older, it's okay to look at that, that, that gore. Again, does this lead to purity? Or does this lead to evil things? Verse 15 said, The wisdom, this wisdom is not from above, which comes down from the Father, but is earthly, natural, you know, demonic. I don't play video games, you guys don't know that, but, but I do see the commercials for them, for the video games, and I, I love it. It'll show a video game, then voice comes on and says, rated M for mature, mature audiences. Like allowing this into your mind is a sign of maturity. It would seem like the mature thing to do would be to say no to putting these things in our mind. But we got street smarts. I can handle it. I can handle the world. It's God's smarts that is making us pure. The hundreds of decisions that we say no to. No, I won't look at this. No, I won't pursue this. No, I will not hold this. No, I won't buy that. That's the wisdom that is going to lead to my life being pure before God or leading to, to, to evil things that are natural. See, so you kind of get the point of what, you know, James is trying to drive home here. My life, my faith is defined by my decisions I make on a daily level. It's not, by, it's not defined by the decisions I make while I'm here at church. It's defined by my attitude in the midst of trials, by my obedience to God's word, whether I'm a hearer or I'm a doer, by my interaction with my fellow man, whether I show favoritism, to people and, and you know look down on those who are in need. It's shown by my actions, by my good works, it's shown by my use of my tongue. You know, it's shown by where I'm allowing my life to steer to point. Verse 17 says, wisdom from above is without hypocrisy. Hypocrisy, saying one thing, doing something else. And if we come to church we claim the name of Jesus Christ. We sit there and we sing these songs. We worship Him. We read God's Word. We, we, we nod in assent to the truth of God, but we go out here and we live a different wisdom. We apply a different wisdom in our life. That's hypocrisy. And wisdom that is from above is without hypocrisy. You know, I get the feeling that if, if James, you know, he is so right in your face. He just lays it out there. I get the feeling that if James was writing today, he'd probably say, you know, if you're not going to live your faith, if you're not going to live God's wisdom at work, at least take the, have the decency to take the calendar down. And you know, we don't want to come across as, as hypocrites to the world. To play the fool that we let everything in. We're not discerning at all. But we are over halfway through the book of James. And quite honestly, James' approach of writing, his no-nonsense way of writing, has, has really been refreshing. And I've had a lot of feedback from, from the book of James from you. Um, you know, I, I think it's because we live in a culture that is constantly coddling us. 
We are afraid to stand for anything lest somebody get offended. And, and then this overlaps into our faith. And we forget the high and holy calling that comes with bearing the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We forget that God, if we are Christians, He has saved us to something. Saved us to be something, to be His child. He has saved us for a purpose. He has called us for a reason. And that is not to spend ourselves on the world. And we get inundated there with so much truth and so much wisdom that is out there. You know, so much wisdom often from God, you know, on how to conduct our lives and how to, you know, live at home and work and interaction with the world. But we often treat it like it's just another option for me. You know, just, you know, one opinion in the midst of all these opinions that are feeding my life. And then what is natural, my flesh, my selfish ambition seems to often drive my decisions. But if I'm a Christian, God's call to me is different, to be different, to take our faith seriously. My faith should saturate every single nook and cranny of my life, not just my decision on whether I'm going to come to church on Sundays or if I'm going to get involved or, or, or do whatever. There's a verse in Philippians 1.6, I know it's very well known to you, but Paul is writing to the Philippians believers. And he says this, verse 6, he says, for I am confident of this very thing. What, what, what was it that Paul was confident of? He says that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Jesus Christ. Paul says, I have confidence that, that God is working in your lives, that your lives are changing that every day you're becoming more and more like Jesus Christ. That was his confidence. Not that they had squelched the working of the Spirit in his life, in their lives. That they had turned their back on God or, or, or made it just one of many options. I have confidence in you that, that what you read and what you see and what you hear are beginning to apply. And I just wonder, you know, for us to search our heart, can, can, can this confidence still be said of us? Can it be said of you? Can it be said of me? That I am striving to grow? That I am striving to live God's truth? And I don't do it to earn God's favor. I do it because He loved us and gave His Son for us. And I want to be like Jesus. Is that still where we are striving to be? Who we are striving to be like? And we have a new year ahead of us. Let me ask you, do you have any spiritual goals whatsoever? Areas in your life that, that you want to give to God and have Him have more control? Areas that you've discerned that maybe you're struggling in, but, but you want to get back into the presence of God? Is the desire still there for you to grow? That you want to be different at the end of 2015 than you are right now at the beginning of 2015? You want to be different in your relationship to Christ? That you want to have made a difference for Christ in the people around you? In your witness? In your testimony? Do you still have the desire to be engaged in your faith? Or has it settled to something that's become comfortable, manageable for us as we live in this world? Father, I ask you, Father, just to search my heart, search each one of our hearts. Father, we need to be laid open bare before you. So, Father, that you can speak to us. We need to take those walls down. We need to set aside our selfish ambition, our pride. We need that humility to be broken before that desire, that passion, Father, to be like your Son, Jesus Christ. So, Father, when I pray for, for my life, I pray for everybody here, Lord, that this year you will continue, and you will give me that passion for your Word, that as I read it, it will be fresh to me, that, Father, it will be as you are speaking to me, and that's truth, Lord, will be a desire for my life. Reach number one.
promise, Lord, I know this is going to be different. One. These changes you're going to reveal in my life are going to be throughout this year. But God, I thank you that in your hands, you are the potter. And we are the clay and you lovingly shape us and mold us, Father, for your eternal purpose and for your glory. I just thank you that one who loves me so much and cares for me so much is out of control. So, Lord, I just give you that seat. I give you that, uh, the, the lordship of my life, Father. And I will thank you, God, for, for what you will do when we have that spirit and that heart before you. Thank you, Father. Amen. Our closing hymn is going to be number 456. And I ask you to go ahead and turn there. Find a place to go ahead and stand together with us. Let all who come behind us find us faithful. Oh, may all who come behind us find us faithful.